Welcome to the Skip and Shannon Undisputed Podcast. I'm Joy Taylor. You can catch us Monday through Friday at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 Pacific on FS1. Here's what this podcast is all about. It's an unscripted, unfiltered, undisputed version of the day's show, and there is a lot to get into in today's podcast. Skip believes that King James only wants to play two more years in Cleveland, Ohio. Shannon thinks that Tom Brady's resume can possibly make him not just the best quarterback, but he has a chance to be the greatest NFL player in history. Pro Football Hall of Famer Chris Carter gives his answer about who's the greatest wide receiver ever and also shares an Augusta National Golf Club analogy to explain his answer. Our friend Rob Parker is in the house to break down the anticipated Australian Open final between Serena and Venus Williams and the impact they've had on sports. Plus, four-time Super Bowl champion Bill Romanowski comes back today to argue that if Tom Brady gets a fifth Lombardi trophy, he'll pass Joe Montana as the greatest quarterback of all time. Finally, FS1 basketball analyst Jim Jackson is here to tell us how losing Ennis Cantor will affect Russell Westbrook's triple-double chances this year. Skip, we have to talk about you-know-who to start. Just want to remind you, there's only one man in all of sports who could upstage the Super Bowl day after day after day, and that's LeBron James, the most interesting man in sports. Not the greatest player, just the most interesting Stop, player. He's the baddest yeah. man dribbling a basketball oh, that he? can breathe oxygen. You know, and I'm convinced he's now making waves just because he's so frustrated and upset that his <laughs> Dallas Cowboys aren't in this game. They should be in well, this game. Well, you have this in, that in common with him. I no. think... Skip Bayless is upset and disappointed his Cowboys. LeBron's the number one Cowboy fan, not me. No. I no, take backseat to LeBron on that. I bet you LeBron, will. he's got Cowboy paraphernalia and gear and jerseys. And you don't. Huh? I just got a hat and a T-shirt. That's all I he got. Has just, he has the Cowboys in his heart. That's yeah. the most important place. Tennis shoes that's full of great. tennis shoes. Sweats that's cowboy. No, I don't have a 22 no. jersey like LeBron does. It's okay. or, or LeBron jammies. Like <coughs> well, let's get it started with the troubles in Cleveland. ESPN reports that LeBron James and the Cavs owner, Dan Gilbert, are at odds over the team's payroll. Reportedly, LeBron agreed to re-sign with the Cavs in 2014 because he was promised the team would spend unconditionally on talent. Earlier this week, LeBron said the Cavs needed to add a bleeping playmaker. Shannon, how will this play out? Skip, remember I told you, grandmother used to say, if oh, it, doesn't, if it yeah. doesn't come out in the wash, mm -hmm. it'll come out in the rinse. Now it's becoming abundantly clear mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. this was this frustration mm -hmm. and this talking was never meant for David Griffin. And because we said, well, why didn't if you had a problem with, you know, with the roster, why didn't you go upstairs? It was not directed at David Griffin. It was directed at Dan Gilbert mm -hmm. because, as Joy read, they had an agreement. Now, normally, before the contract came into effect, a meeting, I mean, a contract was a meeting of the minds. Skip, you're going to do something. I'm going to do something. We shake hands. But somewhere along the lines, Joy, you know, the lines of communication was blurred. You promised me a cow. Then you turn around and say, well, I got some, some, some cabbages or some rutabagas for you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know what? Let's start writing things down so that way we know what the, what the terms of our agreements are. Skip, if he promised LeBron that he would spend the money to get players to make sure they're always in contention, well, he should do that. And let me tell you why, Skip. Do you know that when LeBron left after the 2010 season, in 2010, the Cavaliers were valued at $476 million. His first year away in Miami, the value of the team dropped to three fifty-five. dollars LeBron comes back. His first full year, 2015, the value of the Cavaliers increased $400 million. Mm -hmm. Now the value is $1.1 billion. When he bought the team in 2000 and what, I think it's five, it was, he paid $375 million. So we see where this is going. His, his, the value of the team has increased. And why has it increased, Skip Bayless? Mm. LeBron James. Mm. Who? LeBron James. Kyrie Irving. Stop it, Skip! Yeah, when Kyrie, when he got Kyrie, yeah. you, you saw what happened. Mm -hmm. Skip, LeBron is looking, says, hold on, we got a $4.8 million trade exception. We got a $4.2 million trade mm -hmm. exception. We also have an empty, a vacant roster spot. We can also make some player-for-player -player trades, mm -hmm. and you guys are standing pat. And that's why he clarified with a tweet, this is not at Griff, because I know Griff and the staff has done a great job of surrounding me with talent. I'm with you. That's why. So you're like, well, okay, he, he's taking David Griffin off the hook, mm -hmm. you know. So now it comes out that the odd that LeBron is having 
is not with Griffin and the management. It's with Dan Gilbert and his unwillingness to spend the money that he promised Braun that he would spend. But you know what I told you about promises? Mm -hmm. They're like pie crust, thin and easily broken. Mm. Now Dan Gilbert wants to renege and rescind the promise that he promised the king. Mm. So let me tell you how LeBron's mm. probably going to do this, Skip. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, vacation time. You know, kids about to have yeah. uh, a winter break, mm -hmm. two weeks vacation. Mm -hmm. He and Savannah and the kids going to Ocho Rios or mm -hmm. Cabo San Lucas, kick our heels up for about two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Dan. When you're ready to spend some money and get me a playmaker and get me a big, call Rich Paul because mm. I'm going to be in Mexico. Chilling. Really? So he's going to take his basketball and go to Mexico? We ain't going to have no basketball. We ain't yeah. even thinking about yeah. no basketball. But when you want to do the right thing, mm. Dan Gilbert, by me, mm. call Rich Paul. Mm. Don't you call me because you're on call block. Mm. I think he's already called block from what happened before when he left for South Beach. Yes. Cowardly betrayal, said Dan Gilbert, right? That bridge got burned a long time ago. But you ago. remember, I came on your old show, Skip, after he had uh, yep. uh, announced that he was coming back. And I said, LeBron is a better man than I would ever be. Because some things are unforgivable. You can say, look, I'm disappointed that LeBron... I, I agree with that. I, I don't think I could have made peace with no, that No, you can say I'm disappointed because, uh, you know, I thought what we had going on here, mm -hmm. we were building something special. Yep. I wish LeBron all the best. But when you take it personal... You took it to per cowardly. You call him uh, uh, the self-appointed king. And you all this stuff that you directly, directly. Said, said he quit against Boston in that last Cleveland playoff series before he went to South some Beach. Some things are unforgivable. Mm -hmm. And for me, I could have never played for Dan Gibbert. That's why I say LeBron is a way better man than I could ever be. Because when you attack me, per attack me per uh, professionally, mm -hmm. say that, hey, I get it. But when you start going personal, Mm. At me, I can't play for you, bro. Mm. Okay, now, on Dan Gilbert's side of this, let's, mm -hmm. let's be fair and honest and objective about this. Who has had by far the largest payroll in all the NBA over the last three seasons? Cavaliers. Dan Gilbert. So yes. you got to give him that, I right? I give it to him. By far the most luxury tax spent over the last three seasons has been by Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert. So you got to give him that, Giving right? Giving it to him. And... There's one other man here in the middle of all this named LeBron James who's pointing fingers now upstairs at the top. Why don't you spend money? Who took a max $31 million to play this year? Who will make a max 33 the next year? And if he chooses to stay a third year, $36 million. All max salaries. LeBron James took those salaries, right? Yes. And I'm not being 2020 hindsight hypocrite here. I called him out on that back on the old show numerous times. LeBron, why don't you follow the Tim Duncan method? Why don't you just say, I'm making more money than I'll ever spend off the court? Does he not? Does he? Can, can you not turn on your TV without seeing another LeBron ad? Don't you think he's making a few bucks off the he court? Do, he's doing well I for himself. I think he's doing really well for himself. So why, if in fact you want to catch Michael Jordan, why don't you simply say, well, there is this thing called a salary cap, and if I take the Tim Duncan route here, Tim Duncan over his last three seasons with the Spurs made 10.3, 10.3, and last year $6 million by his choice. He could have, Tim Duncan, the great Tim Duncan, an all-time top five player, he could have said, I have earned the right to make the max all the way home. As many more years, they would love to have him, have him playing now this year, but right. he chose not to. But what if he had said, I'll take 30. 30 and 30 over those last three years. What would it have done to the Spurs' quality depth? Because their second five can be just as lethal as their first five yes. can. Why is that? It was because Tim Duncan took so little money. He took a third and a third and then Probably maybe a fourth dollar. Yeah, of what LeBron James was making because he said, I need to open up the back end of our salary cap for all those role players that we have coming off the bench, the Patty Mills and even Manu coming off the bench. We want to make sure we can keep them under our cap. Mm -hmm. And now LeBron is saying, I don't have enough help. I don't have enough help. Will you, you make $31 like million? Yes, he did. You heard yeah. him. You heard it. I need an excuse. I need to make sure in case this thing falls apart that everybody knows why I don't have any he help. He didn't say it like We're that, Skip. heavy. Yes, that's what he said. You no, know it, didn't. and I know it. Right. Am I right? First of all, <laughs> he made it abundantly clear. In his, he was never, ever going to take less 
than Max Dollars. He did. He said for the longest time he had never been the highest paid player, although he had been the best player, not only on his own team, because he's always been the best player on his own team, but he was never the highest paid player. Okay, but in Miami, the big three, Joy can concur with yes. this, I think, they all took less money than yes. they deserved. They all had to sacrifice some to make sure all three could fit under yes. the cap okay. starting in 20, what was it, 11? 2011. Yeah. But he made it abundantly clear that moving forward, taking less money was not going to be an option. He did? He said, because the owners don't take less money. The franchises are not less valuable. So why am I going to take less money? Just on principle, Nobody's I Nobody's saying I get that, it. He, that he yeah. has to. Right. But if he wants to fit... He, no, he wants I, I want you to fi I want you to figure it out. And if you have to spend two hundred million dollars, this is what you promised. I did not come back here just so you can rake in the money because your franchise is going up in value. The ticket sales are going up in prices. Every, you're reaping. You're not paying me the five hundred million dollars that your franchise has increased. You paid me $32 million. Okay, I, I got it. But again, the cap is the cap, and he can't fix that unless they change the go rules. Go over the, the cap. CBA. Ron is saying go okay. over the he cap. He is, and they have been going over the well, cap. Well, keep going. Okay, keep going. I think there is a larger and a deeper issue at work here. I have one source close to this situation who tells me that he still believes that LeBron is angling in his heart of hearts toward he wants to reunite or unite with, remember the banana boat brethren? Mm -hmm. Remember that picture, the, the famous or maybe infamous picture? Who are those big four brothers? They are like brothers. Mello. He, Mello, Dwayne, CP3, right? Yep. So right now, I think LeBron is also upset. This is just me, and I've heard this from one source, and I'm not going to take this one to the bank, but knowing what I know about LeBron, how much he loves Melo like a brother, and that is not overstated, and Dwayne and Chris, that they are truly, seriously, v as close as non-brothers can get. Yeah. And LeBron, they've all talked publicly over the last couple of years, some, some way, somehow, we gotta get together and finish this thing out together. Remember, they're all later in their careers now because three of them are in their 14th season and Chris Paul is in his 12th season. So they're, they're getting at the backside of their prime years. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Okay. So in LeBron's heart of hearts, I believe he was pushing for the mellow for Kevin Love deal. And he, again, you look at it like a GM would look at it and say, that's a dumb deal because Kevin Love is four years younger and fits the offense better. But you were doing it with Kyrie in the offense. I think LeBron would also like to do the Kyrie for Chris Paul swap with the Clippers, straight up. And you might say as a GM, come on, Kyrie is, is he is so much younger. That's what, if I'm okay. Dan Gilbert and Dave Griffin, that's where I draw the line. Okay, you would. And I think they are drawing the line. And then Dwayne is already making waves in Chicago about he wants out. And guess where he would like to wind up with? LeBron James. Some way, somehow, he would probably take the minimum to fit under that cap right now just to be reunited with LeBron and be united with his other brothers. So my point is, I believe that LeBron, nearing, well, he's halfway through his 14th year, mm -hmm. he's got three rings. I think he would tell you right now on a lie detector, I have a, I would have a better, is he calling you right now? That might no. be LeBron. No, it's not. Who is it? Nobody. Nobody, thank you. <laughs> so LeBron would tell you right now, heart of hearts, lie detector, that he would have a better chance of winning the next two NBA championships against Kevin Durant's Golden State Warriors if he had Melo on one wing, him on the other wing, and CP3 running the show with Dwayne coming off the bench and help. I promise you he would tell you we would have a better chance against Durant and Steph and Clay and Draymond. And, I, and I'm telling him, no chance whatsoever. Okay, now he might be speaking with his heart, but it would speak very strongly. And I will, t I, this you could take to the bank, that he has made that clear to David Griffin and then above to Dan Gilbert. Mm -hmm. This is how I want to finish my career. I want these guys with me. Because LeBron has to think I've got two or three more prime kind of years, yes, I right? Yes, I believe he has uh, okay. three. Yes. All right, and, and he, th this is their dream. This is what he thinks on, on just star power, firepower, brotherhood. They think that they could be the superheroes who would go beat Kevin Durant and Steph Curry. I, that, that roster could not beat Kevin Durant. First of all, there's no way, no how, I'm trading Kyrie Irving at 24 years of age for Chris Paul. Okay, but you're looking down the road, right? 
I'm I don't gonna, think LeBron's looking that far down the road. I'm not worried about down the road. I'm talking about in the car with me right now. Okay. Kyrie riding shotgun. Okay. I got no room for Chris Paul. I'm I'm with you on that, but but you're not thinking the way LeBron James thinks. Look, remember I'm, those guys have won at the international level together. Now again, they're playing inter, they're, they're playing, playing international you know, players. I, I, I agree, but that's what they think. That's what he's talked about. You've read the quotes in the past. This, this is not just pie in the sky, pipe dreams kind of stuff. This is what they want to do. If they want to get together in year 18, 19, something okay, like that. Okay, but then it would be too late. Well, hey, if I'm Dan Gilbert, if I'm David Griffin, LeBron, I love you, and you mean so much to the city, the, the, uh, the state of Ohio, Akron, you mean so much to the Cavaliers organization, but I am not trading Kyrie Irving for Chris Paul. I am not trading Kevin Love for Carmelo Anthony. I am not bringing D. Wade in and dumping all my... Because he's only one player. I'm not going to do it. Now, you do what you need to do moving forward. Now, if you need to opt out next year and go somewhere else, LeBron, we appreciate everything you've ever done for the Cavaliers organization. But I am not about to do this. This makes absolutely no sense. Now, I'm with LeBron 1,000%. You got 9.2 in trade exceptions. You got a roster spot that's vacant right now. You got some pieces that you could possibly trade on your bench. But I am not giving up Kyrie Irving. I am not giving up Carmelo Anthony for no... Car uh, not Carmelo. I'm not giving up Kevin Love for Carmelo Anthony, Skip. That deal doesn't make sense. It doesn't make them better. It makes them weaker because they've get been getting pounded on the boards lately. S Carmelo is not a stronger rebounder. Let's just say you match point for point. Camillo's about 22, 23. Kevin Love's about 20, 21. Kevin Love is also a double-digit rebound guy. He can also, he's revamped his game to where he can catch and shoot, and he plays less with his back against okay, the basket. You know what LeBron would argue with you? What? That he could reinvent, re have a rebirth with Carmelo in Cleveland. He, he just thinks... Melo's an unhappy player in New York, that, that he's a shell of himself because he's not happy. I don't think LeBron is real happy playing with Kyrie and Kevin Love and the rest of them. Richard Jefferson is his only one real close friend on the team. Right. So don't, don't you, if you're LeBron, don't you want to be happy with what you're doing? I, I just don't think he's that happy with this group. Well, for, for me, Skip, I got a lot of friends, but that didn't mean I want to play football with mm -hmm. them. I got it. Um, and... and for Kyrie to be 24 years of age, there's not a shot that he can't make. He can finish at the rim. And we've seen over the last three to four years, Chris Paul is always missing four or six, eight weeks with some injury. He's not getting healthier. D. Wade has to take time off because of those knees. Mm -hmm. Carmelo has, a, has bad knees and his back. I'm not bringing... Listen... This ain't no assisted living facility that we're running in Cleveland. <laughs> so if you think you've got to bring all these old, decrepit basketball players and think about what they used to do and bring them up in here, that's not going to happen, LeBron. How, how old and decrepit did CP3 look earlier this year when on a Thursday night they went to Cleveland? And yes. what did they do? He looked pretty it, spry to me. But, but, but what do we know, Skip? Every year, he's missing six to eight weeks because of an injury. Mm -hmm. Dwayne Wade plays three games, he's going to miss a game. He's going to play five games, he's going to sit two. Carmelo Anthony, his knee, you know, knee tendonitis or his back. Mm -hmm. Skip, I'm not about to have it. Okay, but here's what you're missing. I don't think LeBron wants to play more than two more years in Cleveland, Ohio, just because of Dan Gilbert. He's going to serve it out, try to max it out, he would like to max it out with his banana boat brethren, but after it's over, however it ends, after it, in two more years he has a, a, an opt this out. Year, yeah, it's his choice, year, yeah. right? Yes. Then I believe he finishes his career. I don't know, maybe in L.A. He's got a house in what Brentwood, I think yes, it is, right does. here in L.A. Mm -hmm. And finish it out as the Lakers start to you know continue to rebuild. Maybe he says that's where I end it. Maybe he goes to New York and ends it there, depending on the state of the two teams on the coast or the other coast. So I I, I think this is. He, he's frustrated because he wants to max out his chances in Cleveland right now at the end of his prime. Right. And then wherever his swan song is will be elsewhere, not in Cleveland, Ohio. I believe, I believe his best chances are they can sign up, get a big, or they can get a playmaker. I think his best chances, Skip, they're not winning with, look, I understand that he wants to play with Melo and D. Wade and mm -hmm. CP3. Skip, all of them together, they're not winning a championship. They're not beating Golden State. Because with all those Even guys... Even you would say that? No way. No. Who, like, they still have the greatest player on the planet, right? Yeah, but the, uh, the Warriors have four. They got two great players. 
two very good players. Think about it. Four of their five starters are in the All-Star game. So who 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 go, I mean, let's just say if you get if you get uh LeBron and, and KD to cancel each other out, who's gonna guard Clay? Who's gonna guard Steph? Well, LeBron would say, who's gonna guard Mello? You know, and who's gonna guard CP3? That's what he would say. CP3 is CP3 is a legit point guard. He's more to assist the basketball than scoring. But Skip, as much as I love CP3, Kyrie Irving is for real. Kyrie Irving is the top. I, is a top. You five know how player. I feel. I mean, everybody keeps talking, but I'm not taking. Ky I'm not taking CP3 over Kyrie. I'm not taking him over uh, uh, Russ. I'm not taking him over Steph Curry. James Harden now plays the point. Okay, he's now a two guard masquerading at the point. I'm not taking him over him. Mm. And come to think about it, truth be told, I don't know how many. I, I mean, I might. It's, it's neck and neck between him and Dame Lillard. What about John Wall? So, I mean, Skip, when you really look at it, I know the, all the intangibles that he can run an offense and he mm -hmm. plays defense, but there are like five, six, seven point guards that are better options than CP3. Mm. Well, I agree with you. Kyrie is the most valuable player on the Cavs right Man, now. Man, stop, yes, please. Well, you just made the case. Give, give me some water. Oh. Give me something. Oh. Oh, Why do you take it out on her? Because she always chiming in. She always. She didn't say to... a word. Yeah, you did say a word. She looked. I just but she listened didn't... to everything that you said. Dan Gilbert. I always do, do. Dan, I don't want to break up again. All this, I don't want to break up again. Sounds really nice. It sounds nice. They're going to tell LeBron what to do. Mm -hmm. All that sounds nice until LeBron says, "Okay, I'm going to pick up my basketball and go somewhere else." Mm -hmm. Dan, I don't I've don't... been through it. I love Pat Riley, but mm -hmm. you draw a line in the sand with LeBron, and he goes, "Okay," and walks over it and goes wherever he wants. Dan. You know, I don't want to break up with you again, it Dan. I mean, nice. the first time we stayed apart for four years and then we reunited. Exactly. If I break up with you again, I'm gone for good. Right, That's but Dan Gilbert's not going to be the one to, to push that. Well, hey, well, go make it right. Make the money right, Dan. Make the money Scott, right. what do you say? LeBron gets what LeBron wants. That's how it works. Oh. That Bottom line, end of story, <laughs> next topic. <laughs> no mercy. Tom Brady is getting ready to appear in his NFL record seventh Super Bowl. Brady has won four and lost two. Joe Montana went to four Super Bowls and won all of them. We're joined by four-time Super Bowl champion Bill Romanowski. Bill, welcome back. Thank you. Bill, you won two titles with Montana. I did. Would Brady pass Montana as the greatest ever if he wins Super Bowl 51? I think you got to hand it over to him. Mm. Because you don't give credit for the two losses. It's almost like those don't exist. It's right. like with John Elway. Yeah. You know, his losses didn't exist, but when he got the two wins, that's what you credit him for. So I think you hand over the reins if he gets the fifth. Wow. I agree. I mean, and, and I'm not just a guy that just looking at, says, okay, because he has five Super Bowls, that's what. I'm also looking at his body of work, what, it le what led to him getting to these Super Bowls, the division titles, the 11 AFC championship games, winning 14 titles in 15 years, uh, AFC East titles in the years that he started and finished the season. When you look at his body of work, all the touchdowns, all the passing yardage, uh, the, all the all pros, the two MVP regular seasons, mm -hmm. the three MVPs, he probably, if they were to win, I'm guessing he'll probably be the MVP again. So that'll be five MVPs, in the, uh, four MVPs in the Super Bowl with five wins. It's hard to argue. I mean, look, I'm a guy that played in the era and I hold my era very sacred, but I'm also a realist, Skip. And if this guy were to mm -hmm. do what, what we think he might be able to do a week from Sunday, I don't really know how you argue any moving and forward. Let me add this. I think if you could just take a 10-year period, compare it 10 and 10, hey, I could probably say Montana beats him. But the volume in the years with Brady, mm -hmm. it's just too much uh, to overlook. Question. Yes. I threw this at Shannon earlier in the show. You have to pick nits when you make these choices, so it's a, it's borderline unfair. But did Joe Montana, with whom you played and won, and knew you knew him well, yes. as well as anybody could know him off the field, did he benefit from, how much advantage did he gain from playing in what I thought was the most dynamic and creative offense ever invented by the man, Bill Walsh, who was calling the plays for Joe Montana. Was that a, a, a big or, or medium advantage for Montana over a Brady whose coach was the defensive side of the ball and, and Brady became sort of his own offensive coordinator as the offense evolved around Tom? Is that, w would you give Tom the advantage over Joe because Joe had the advantage of that offense? I think if you took away Bill Walsh from Joe Montana, 
He would have been a really good quarterback, but not a great one. Okay. Well, that's that's a big statement, you know. Cause, cause yeah. Because, but if if that's the case, you're gonna have to give. Because Coach Belichick is arguably the greatest defensive mind of all time. Yes. And Brady has only had that. His defense and Brady, all those playoff games, I think it's 33 playoff games, they've only given up 30 points three times. So if you're gonna if you're gonna credit Joe for having Bill Walsh, you need to also give Coach Belichick some credit on Tom Brady's end. Um, but as, as Romo is saying, if you look at his body of work and how long it is, there's something to be said for longevity. Mm -hmm. And if you play, <clears throat> you're going to have numbers. But he's playing and he's having great numbers. It's not like he's just holding on. It's not like they're winning in spite of Tom Brady. Mm -mm. They're winning because of Tom Brady. And because yeah, you were making the case they were winning in spite of Peyton last year that they won the Super I, I did. I disagree with he that, made, but he, you thought he went along for the ride. He made some big throws. But also, yeah. Skip, you know, you look at, you say, well, Tom mm -hmm. should have this. There were some times that Adam Vinatieri saved the day. He made some big clutch kicks in the Super Bowl, in the first Super Bowl they won, the one they beat uh, uh, the Carolina Panthers. Mm -hmm. Those were clutch kicks. And Tom now, made some clutch throws to get them in position. But see, Joe, kicks. Joe really, Joe didn't leave it up to the field goal kicker. Mm -hmm. Joe said, "I got this." Drive 92 yards, throw the two, uh, 200 jet X slant mm -hmm. to John Stall, uh, John Stall was John Taylor mm -hmm. in the end zone. He did. 55 10. So you look at his body of work, Joe was, was phenomenal. The MVPs in the regular season, the MVPs in the playoff. They won 10 games for like 16 straight years. But with Tom Brady, 14 division titles in the 15 years that he started and finished the season, the seven Super Bowls, 11 AFC champions. Roman, I was telling him, yeah. I played 14 years. I won the division three times. I won the division as many, I won the Super Bowl as many times as I won a division. Mm -hmm. And I played 14 years. Here's a guy that's going in his, you know, 16th year starting. Seven Super Bowls. Seven, Skip. So mm -hmm. every other year, basically, count on Tom Brady being wherever the Super Bowl is going to be. Count on him calling the plays mm -hmm. for the Patriots. You can draw comparisons on the defensive side. Because George Seifert, we were always... Top three, oh. top four defense. And loaded in the with league. talent, I gotta say. And, loaded. You know, and I think there were some years where Brady did it without a top defense. I, I they just agree. outscored teams and other offenses couldn't keep up with the scoring. Okay, Shannon Sharp, back yep. to you. Question for you. Earlier in the show, you went so far as to say Brady has already eclipsed Joe Montana yeah. just by getting to his seventh yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah. You shocked me with that statement because on yesterday's show, you were hard on Tom Brady that he cheated and he lied about it, and you are convinced of that. You are in the Hall of Fame. You're not going to hold that against his, no. his legacy? No, because just like I don't hold, hold against Barry. Barry is the greatest player that ever, baseball <clears throat> player that I've ever seen. Barry Bond. Now, I don't, see, I, don't, I don't know anything about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and all these guys that played in the 20s and the 30s, but as long as I can remember watching baseball, Barry Bonds is the greatest guy, the greatest player that I've ever seen. So I agree with that. And Tom Brady, the volume of work, how much he benefited from Spygate, what happened in Spygate, the deflated football. All I know is this, and it's going to be on his resume, but also what's going to be on his resume, a seven-time Super Bowl participant, mm. a four- or five-time winner, uh, 11 AFC championship games. Mm. If, that's if he stops tomorrow after the Super Bowl. Who says he doesn't play another two or three years? I agree So with he that. can add to that mm. resume. So you start getting seven, eight Super Bowls, 12, 13 AFC championship games. W what are we debating? Mm. You know, and, and also, too, I look at it this way. Tom Brady goes up against the defensive coordinator of the other team. I really do believe it was Bill Walsh going up against the okay. defensive wow. coordinator of the other team. Well, you're discounting Montana. No, I'm not discounting. He was awesome. Yeah. I loved him. And I would never discount him. Okay. But I there's a little bit of a difference there. Yeah. All right, I, I need to see Tom, and I'm the biggest Brady fan, you know that. Yep. But, but I need to see him win this Super Bowl and win MVP without Rob Gronkowski at age 39. Whoa, that's game over for Joe Montana. That, okay, but don't discount again. Joe Montana went four for four and should have been the MVP all four times. Again, as I told you earlier, Jerry Rice with 215 yards of receiving, which was the Super Bowl record. Mm -hmm. He won that one against the Bengals because I'm convinced, and I was in the press box that day, they vote too, They used to vote too early. They mm -hmm. would vote with two minutes to go, and you already mentioned it. 
34 seconds left. Montana to John I, Taylor. Ball I, game. I right? played in that game. I give that to Joe. Good. Thank you. Because it was yeah. Joe. Yeah. Right. It was. And, and the, and, but the thing is, Skip, is that what Brady has been able to do, the longevity in which he's sustained this excellence. The, I mean, normally when you see greatness, greatness has a shelf life. But if you really think about it from about for like the last 12 years, because I don't really think I don't really count the first one because Brady threw for like 145 yards he and he did. was the MVP. That was it. And even even the, he wasn't the Brady that we know until probably like the third Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So from 2004, moving forward, he's been great. He's been all time great. He's never had an off year where you're like, well, Brady's done. You, you've never seen that. And year in and year out, they're always competing because basically it's like. No matter how great offenses are, even when they, the Broncos got paid and they were putting up all those points, it still came down to Tom Brady. Mm. And you look at the guys that started the Super Bowl in the last, basically since 2000, it's been Tom Brady seven, Peyton Manning four, Ben Roethlisberger three, and Joe Flacco one. Mm. That's it. That's all you got. Montana okay. was around other Hall of Famers. Uh, I, I would say. But here's the thing, though, Skip. Joe won two Super Bowls before he even knew who Jerry Rice was. So that's why I'm not going to add any more credit to Tom Brady playing without Gronk because he won three and he didn't even know a Gronk existed. Yeah, he won two throwing to Dwight Clark, Mason. Yeah. Those, right? Yeah. Was, was, yes. he, was that your – Dwight yeah. – yeah, yeah, that was – we, we, we remember now, we, we're making the case that Jerry is the greatest <laughs> football player of all time okay. and he won two without him. Okay. Okay, I got it. But back to Bill's original point. You said you just – throw out the losses, like just forget about them. But remember, <laughs> at least Brady didn't get elway and in his two, and no, no disrespect to John nope. Elway, but, but in those first three, Elway just got blown out. Again, didn't have much defense, but it's 39 to 20, 42 to 10, 55 to 10. And you dismiss them. You say, well, he won two on the backside. But in Brady's, he could have won the one that he lost first to Eli, and he – he should have won both of them to me. But, but again, the first one is just – it's just the luckiest pass I've seen in the history of the Super Bowl was Eli Manning throwing to David Tyree. And Brady had done enough. Here it is again. I hate this play. You keep how bringing did, up on him. How did he get out of the sack? I don't he know. got out the I same way he got out of it 10 years ago, the same <laughs> way he spins out of it. How did, how did Tyree catch that in his face mask? But you know what, really Skip, the thing it. is – is that people give John so much credit because when you really look back at it and you look at those rosters, and I'm not trying to diminish anybody, they said, what other quarterback other than John Elway could have even got these teams to a Super Bowl? Okay, fair enough. But, again, it, it's on his resume that you got blown out your oh, first it's, three it's, times. Oh, it's, it's there. Where you okay. rank it, like, like Roman said, once you get to two, all of a sudden the, the three doesn't look as bad. They're on there, but I guarantee you you're going to put those first two Super Bowls up there, and then you'll talk about, you know, one of the 50 greatest players of all time, blah, 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 blah. And then you come down here to the very end, and you hopefully people are tired of reading. Then you start putting 55 to 10, mm. 42 to 10, <laughs> 39 to 20. Put those at the bottom. Yeah. So yeah. you're already done. Brady's Brady. eclipsed Montana. You, you need to see. I need, I need yeah. the fifth. Yeah. I need uh, the I'm fifth. with you. I need the fifth. Need I need the fifth. Yep. No mercy. Russell Westbrook scored 45 points in last night's win against the Mavericks, but he lost to center Ennis Cantor. Cantor punched a chair during a timeout in the second quarter last night and reportedly could miss up to two months after fracturing his forearm. We're joined by our FS1 basketball analyst, Jim Jackson. Welcome, Jim. Welcome, Jim. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. What's up, Jack? What up, baby? Oh, you? oh, you're buddying up to the analyst now. <laughs> right. Get him over on your side. No, it's no, okay. I don't do that, it's Skip. all right. I don't play that way. <laughs> Kansas Smoocher. Uh -huh. Jim, we'll get to you in a minute. Let's get, let me start with you. Does Cantor's injury impact Westbrook's chances of averaging a triple-double this season? Yes. Big blow. I said before the season he would average a triple-double. This is going to, to hamper those chances. I said before the season, this team would finish in the four seed. You have all but ridiculed me for that. This team had won three straight and seven of ten and was creeping up toward that four seed. Now I think they're going to do some creeping backward because this was such a big piece of, of their whole game. Even though he only played 22 minutes a night, Ennis Canner, they were 22 big minutes. And this was a bad break, both figuratively and, and literally, in that it was such a weird injury because he actually let out his frustration the correct way to do it. He did not do it with a closed fist. He opened his hand, but he hit the back of a folding chair on the back of the cushion. And what happens? 
it folds up. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so as the leading edge, the metal edge of the chair folded up, it caught him right across the forearm, snap, gone for whatever, two months or however long it will be. He's meat on his forearm like me right yeah. here. <laughs> well, he's a basketball player, right? <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. And <laughs> what does that mean? Look, th this guy is a force coming off the bench. He is. And, and again, I was surprised we checked on the stats. That, that he's only fourth in, in the assists of Russell Westbrook, mm -hmm. that he averages only the fourth percent of those assists. Mm -hmm. Steven Adams is 25%, Oladipo 17. I was surprised Robertson's 15% and then Ennis is 14. Well, it, th that surprised me because he's, he's like perfect. They, they have good chemistry. They like each other. Mm -hmm. And Russ looks to him because he is really a skilled big man, as skilled a big man as there is in basketball in yes. the low post. Yep. He, can, he can really... He, he can move, he can create, he's clever with the ball, he doesn't play a lick of defense, but they just wait on him to come in. And, and I love the stat, PER, player efficiency rating, he, he's always near the top 10. Right now he's 14th, only two slots behind LeBron James. So, so he, the, the, the stats love him, and this team is going to miss him <coughs> dearly. Yeah, and the bigger question is what happens moving forward with this Oklahoma team because their margin of error was so thin anyway Yes. in regards to winning. Now, mm -hmm. as far as the triple-doubles, I thought it was going to be a challenge for Russell the way he plays all year because, because of that margin of error, because he was dependent so much on guys who weren't great shooters to begin with to be able to continue to knock down shots late in the season. I thought this team, the way they were built, would be somewhere in that fourth, fifth slot, mm -hmm. okay, because of the way the West was. But it's, it to me, the injury impacts much more than that because now you're, you're, you're talking about a situation that you're going to slide back before you go into All-Star break. You've played 47 games already. Now he's going to miss, you know, a couple months. That right there, where does that put you in regards to momentum? Guys are playing well. I think it really impacts not only just Westbrook, just, and you said it, Skip, Shannon, you understand this, an uh, injury to a key player not just averaging a triple-double, but where does this put you in regards to the playoff picture and seeding, which is so important to this OKC team? I had him as a seventh seed. And, Skip, this is where you and I debate, and I said this is probably why he will not win the MVP because mm -hmm. I had him at seven. Mm -hmm. And right now they're, they're in the sixth seed, but they're one game ahead of the Grizzlies. Uh, the eighth seed, they're six games ahead of, of that team. So I believe they'll finish in the seventh spot. I believe this will have a bigger impact on the team than Russell because he's only averaging 1.4 assists to Cantor. He'll pick that up somewhere else. But I think it will grow. He will not have to rebound even more because Cantor was averaging 6.2 rebounds. Somebody's going to have to pick up that slack. Russell, also his numbers as far as points, is going to probably go up because where do you get those 14 points from? You can't count on Robertson to give you an extra three yeah. to four points a night. I just saw a stat line the other night. He had two points. So I'm like, so where... Are they going to get those points from? Adams, okay, maybe he can give you another two points maybe. here or there. Oladipo, maybe he can give you three or four here or there. Goes back to Russell. So now Russell, watch his average. He's probably going to jump to about 33 points a game. He's probably going to end up, Skip, now I'm convinced that he's probably going to average a triple-double for the simple fact that Cantor's going to be out and someone's going to have to get those 6.3 rebounds that he was getting per night although it was only in 22 minutes. That's what's amazing. The guy's playing less than 22 minutes a night, but he's getting 14.5 points a night. Yeah. That's a lot of – basically, he's coming in the game getting buckets. But Shannon, also, too, but I think that's where Oladipo this, – this is a guy that we know watching him in Orlando can play, yeah. create opportunities. Like I thought Oladipo coming in would take some of that pressure off of Russell to score, but not only just to score, but to make plays. Right. And so that's a person that really needs to step up if OKC – wants to kind of fend off this injury and still stay competitive, I think it falls back not just on Russ, but Oladipo big time has to step up. Because the Nuggets are in the eighth seed right now, Skip. The sixth seed is six and a half games in front of them. Mm -hmm. So the seventh seed, is, so if they fall back, they're still going to be like six and a half, seven games in front of the Nuggets. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Nuggets can make up that kind of ground, even though even after the All-Star break. I, don't I believe that the uh, – OKC will finish in the seventh slot because I believe the Grizzlies are going to finish in the sixth spot. U Utah, Utah's for real. Um, they're going to, yeah. I believe they're going to be in the five, the five spot, and then the Clippers, and you know Houston, and you know Spurs and, and Golden State. But here's the thing: Can Oladipo go get his own points? Can o Can Oladipo He's proven he can, but I don't. I don't. I consistency think, over. I, I think he. I think he falls back to watch Russ. I think he's so. 
um, afraid to take that next step, to stand up to Russ and say, listen, I can be your counterpart. I can help you. But he plays that back role. I right. think he's intimidated by the presence of Russ, by the, how he plays. He has the game to do it. He, yeah. We've seen it in Orlando, yeah. but up to this point, we've seen bits and pieces of when he's really stepped up. We haven't seen that consistency. You know what I loved last night? What happened? Russell scored 45 at home. He was just shooting daggers late in that game. He was great late. I watched the whole game, and when it ended, they interviewed Russ on the court, and then he ran up the tunnel, and Oladipo had waited for him and ran all the way up behind him up the tunnel with his hands on his shoulders mm -hmm. like I'm riding your piggyback, <laughs> you know, which he, he's completely at peace with doing. He's made peace with... I just do what you need me to do. So there's no ego clash between no, right. those two. Mm -hmm. And if Russell, Key, he's now got five 40-plus games, which is, I think, three more than anybody else has. If, if you're right about there's excess out there to be had, and if his energy, as you well know, can stay high enough to keep rebounding at 10, 11, 12 a game at six feet, what are we going to give him? Three, maybe? Six maybe 6'3"? Six three. Six three? I'm not sure he's 6'3". But if he can keep that up, and he can average a triple-double, he's going to win the MVP because the scoring is going to go up. Uh, he's going to lead the league in scoring Yeah, easily. he's going to be averaging 33 points a game. And the thing is with Oladipo, see, Oladipo doesn't have that dog like Kyrie. Kyrie says, okay, Brian, I know you're good, mm -hmm. but I can go get 24 a night easy also. And so Kyrie's going to get here. He is a co-star. Yes, co -star. yes. Oladipo and, not. And, and basically, so when you see the movie, it's Russell Westbrook, and then right when the movie get ready to start, you'll see Victor Ola <laughs> and, 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 and Victor Oladipo. Mm -hmm. So where you see LeBron he's, he's James, Kyrie Irving mm -hmm. in this movie. Mm -hmm. Well, Westbrook is at 23 triple doubles already for the season, which is fifth most in a single season in NBA history already. No mercy. Serena and Venus Williams will face each other in the Australian Open Finals tomorrow. This will be the ninth Grand Slam Finals between the sisters. They have a combined 29 Grand Slam singles titles. We're joined by Rob Parker. Welcome, Rob. What's happening? Good Rob, morning. look at What's Detroit. Look at the new clothes. Oh, he's... Fox did it right. Hey. They did it yeah. right. Shannon loves a good suit. <laughs> yes. What, uh, what has Serena, the impact of Serena and Venus had? For uh, especially black people when it comes to tennis. Here's a sport that we didn't dominate. Of course, we had some great players, mm -hmm. Arthur Ashe and mm -hmm. different people who had success, but they went and took tennis by storm. And I think when you look at all their accomplishments, both of them, Serena obviously bigger than Venus, but still, when you look at their accomplishments, what they were able to do, and I think they never let us down. And when I say they didn't let us down, they were always who they were, even in that world. And I think that's what I admired the most. They didn't have to assimilate and change who they were, be different, you know, like maybe push back their Compton roots to be able to compete on that level and win and let people know who they were. I admired their father, who was a strong black man who raised his daughters and wanted nothing but greatness mm -hmm. for them. I, I do. When I look at their whole history, and I think that for black people, when it comes to tennis, they look at these two and think, boy, did they make us proud. And that's what I look at when I see them, and here they are in another Grand Slam. And even when there was talk about them early on, and some people tried to criticize them. Remember at one point they even said, oh, well, the, the dad, he's Thomas engineering it. He's telling who should win. And mm -hmm. You remember all yes. that stuff, yes. which was crazy, mm -hmm. and a knock on people who are so competitive. Nobody buys into that. I don't care relatives or whatever. You have a brother who played. You know, there's no way he someone's going to say. Win. Exactly. <laughs> I, I can remember playing basketball with my nephew who wanted to play in college basketball, but I, I would not let him win early on. You're not going to win just because. So when they used to say that stuff about them, I used to say, it ain't right, it ain't fair, but I respect them. I love what they did, and I, love, and I think when people think about them, it's the pride they gave our community. So how did that impact in the black community compare to Tiger's impact when he broke through in 1997? And, and I say this all the time. You know this. When I got married, we were in Tokyo, me and my wife then. Who you tricked to marry? I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're not married anymore. Oh, hey. <laughs> she caught on. She, she yeah. was something. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Skip. It was Thank something. You. But, but at that time, we were in Japan, and here I am in a hotel in Tokyo, and we were mesmerized. That's how much to hear Tiger Woods, 
and, and, he, and he wins at Augusta, blows away the field and everything. But I think Tiger was ex the opposite, that down the road, you know, where we were all in love with him and what he brought to us and the same thing. Here's another black guy mm -hmm. in, a, in a sport that's not dominated by black people, yep. right? But he changed. He was different. He didn't really want to be a part of it mm -hmm. or be who he, who he thought he was. And I think people lost it for Tiger. Mm -hmm. He disappointed. The, the Williams sisters, they didn't disappoint. What was Tiger's line to Oprah in, like, 2002? He was Cablasian. He made he, up... He, he resented he, being the, defined yes. as a black man. Even right. though his dad was black, and he had yeah. black skin. And I think people who are black had an issue with that. Cablan Nation, which like was... Cambodian, Ca Asian. No, Ca Ca Caucasian, Caucasian, black, American Indian, and Asian. That was his, his word that he coined for what he was. Can I always say this? Barack Obama, white mother, black father is the first black president. He never wavered, never said, don't call me the first black president, period. They, they aren't, as Rob mentioned, they aren't the first black t female tennis players because you had Althea Gibson, who won Wimbledon. You had Lori <laughs> McNeil. You had mm -hmm. Zena Garrison. And if you yep. follow tennis, I follow tennis. Mm -hmm. And then you had probably the most prominent black tennis player, Arthur Ashe. Mm -hmm. So they weren't the first. But what they were able to accomplish, because let's be 100% real, and that's what you, you told me, Skip, when I took this job. You say, I want you to be authentic. I want you to be you. Let's be 1,000% mm. okay. here. Tennis is a white country club sport. For the most part? For yep. the most part. Mm -hmm. You get two African-American young ladies from Compton, California, <laughs> that did not go to the Voluntary Academy in Florida. Mm -mm. They didn't go to one of these elite schools for mm -mm. tennis. This what, their, their, self their dad and their mom reading, uh, uh, watching DVDs and reading magazines taught their daughters how to play tennis in Compton, California on a tennis court where grass mm -hmm. is growing through the concrete. They've always embraced who they were and how they came to be. They've always embraced being black and they were never ashamed of being black. Mm -hmm. We've seen athletes before and I hate, let's start, let, and uh, OJ. OJ, when people say, we talk to OJ and say, OJ, you black, he says, no, I'm OJ. You look at Tiger Woods. He resented the fact that someone would refer to him as African American. He resented. Think about what resentment means. They, they had beads in their hair when they were 13 and 14 years old and they're playing. People still make racial comments about them. A guy was just let go on another network because he referred to v Venus uh, as a gorilla. Now, maybe he meant it in a certain word, but nah, he didn't mean it you either. know you can't use those gorilla. kind of terms. Let's take it a step further. Now, not in, in, in sports, but in entertainment. Michael Jackson, he didn't want to embrace who he was. You look at Tiger Woods. What do I say that about all of this? When they had their controversy, who was the race of people that embraced them? Well, they when had Michael, to run back home. Right. When Michael Jackson went through what he went through, who was the race of people that embraced him? When Tiger Woods had his controversy, when, when Sponsor was running away from him, the African-American community embraced Tiger. Mm -hmm. The very people that he said he resented being labeled as, he resented mm -hmm. the very people that loved him, even though these are, Venus and Serena, they're sacred in the black community because they've never, ever not stopped being black. Mm -hmm. They've always embraced who they were. They've always been defined. Mm -hmm. We're from Compton, California. Our mom and dad struggle. We riding in the station wagon, going to play tennis. Richard Williams, everybody had it. Oh, Richard Williams talking about these girls are gonna be great. How are they gonna be great? They don't have a professional tennis coach. Mm -mm. How are they gonna be great? They don't go Absolutely. to the academy. Richard Williams says, My daughters are gonna be great. He says, I'm gonna take it a step further. Serena is gonna be the greatest tennis player. Whoever played. The greatest. Mm -hmm. You talk about women. Give me two minutes and I can make the case that she's the greatest tennis player, mm -hmm. male or female. You can make the argument she's one of the greatest athletes. Yes! So with that being said, Skip, we embrace Venus and mm -hmm. Serena in, in a different way that we even... Now, they didn't drive more black little girls to the mm -hmm. tennis court. They didn't drive more blacks to the... You know, like Tiger drove a lot of black... Mm -hmm. Even a lot of go golfers. Mm -hmm. But a lot of African-American golfers took up the game of golf because mm -hmm. of Tiger. They didn't do that. But their impact, they're the greatest siblings to ever live. Mm -hmm. I dare you to find anybody in Can't. any continent or any no. American or anywhere. Mm -hmm. But Skip, for what they were able to do and to embrace who they are and what they are and to say, 
we are unapologetic for being black, mm. Skip, that means so much to a lot of people. I, I hear you. I, I appreciate the perspective from both of you. I love you both like brothers. And I've said this before, for me as a white guy, the Tiger Woods moment at Augusta in 1997 was the most stunning moment for me in sports history because he knocked down the gates of what had been considered or was an all-white club yes. and didn't just win the Masters, he blew it away. But I never could get my arms as a white guy around Tiger because he wasn't very likable. Respectable? Yeah, I mean, respectful? Yes, I had nothing but respect. And he dominated the game the way I think no man ever will, again, certainly in my lifetime. And yet with the Williams sisters, they, they not only broke through, they stayed broken through because they just kept on keeping on. And I could like both of them. And I liked them and, and, and respected them all the way through. And they keep on keeping on at advanced age for tennis players. And it is stunning to me, their longevity. And they yeah. put the Hawkeye in because they were yeah. so cheating so bad against yeah. Venus and Serena. Yeah. Their balls were blatantly out and they were calling them in. And balls that Good were point. in for them, they were calling yeah. out. So Good they point. instituted that. Well, Saturday's yeah. final will be the ninth Grand Slam meeting between the two sisters. Serena leads a series 6 2. The sister. No mercy. Julio Jones is the only receiver in the NFL with over 1,400 yards the last three seasons. On yesterday's show, we were talking about Julio, and the discussion turned into who is the best receiver in NFL history. We're joined now by Chris Carter. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Shannon, you snuck in a little note. Okay. No. Yeah. Silent assassin yeah. over go here. Ahead, go ahead and tell it. We uh, go ahead and tell uh, it what, what the news is. Go ahead and tell what's it. What's the news? Mm -hmm. Bad news. Who is the best yeah. wide receiver of all time, Chris? Well, Joy. Because we work here, <laughs> Shannon and I are going to do something that we don't do, mm. all right? Of the 305 players in the Hall of Fame, these are conversations that only the Hall of Famers. And I learned this from the great Lynn Swan, athletic director at USC. I saw him the other night at the basketball game. And we were in the Ray Nitsky luncheon in 2013, and he stood up. And when you're a rookie um, in the Hall of Fame, you can't say anything at the Ray Nitsky luncheon. It's led by, it was led by Deacon Jones, took over by Ray mm -hmm. Nitschke. And um, it's one of the great things of being in the Hall of Fame. And Lynn Swan stood up and he told me, Chris, we're so glad to have you in the Hall of Fame, but you're never going to have to answer this question again. And that is the question, who is the greatest receiver ever? Because now there's no difference between you, Jerry, Michael, myself, or anyone else. We're all in the hall. And there is no first team in the hall, second team in the hall, back room in the hall. It's all, we're all in the hall. Now, privately, we do have conversations about certain positions, but mm -hmm. we don't do that publicly. As Hall of Famers, we have a certain degree of respect for everyone that's in the Hall of Fame and what they've done. So we don't like the discredit. So if we're going to have a conversation about who's the best receiver, I can't go any further without mentioning great receivers like Don Hudson, Lance Allworth, Charlie Raymond Hiddigan. Berry. Like, these guys, they never get included because we have such a short window in video. So now only the guys that have played the last 30 years can be included. But I've never heard anyone present even – a argument that was worth discussing that would would pit someone over Jerry Rice. Like I haven't seen, and I'm I'm one of the people that I believe that Jerry Rice, not only was he the greatest wide receiver, but he was one of the greatest football players that ever played. And I could make that argument. By position, Jerry Rice can match up with. You take all the other great players in the position they played, and Jerry Rice is in that conversation with well, who were the greatest guys that ever played in the NFL? Let alone wide receiver, Jerry Rice, consistency, explosion, big games, championships. Jerry Rice did all those things. Yards after the catch, tough catches, focused on football, love football, driven, conditioned, all those things. He set a great example for me as a young receiver playing 20 years in the league of how to go about your profession, how to get better at your craft, and really how to utilize your body and force your body to do great things. So for me, it's fairly easy. Jerry Rice is the greatest wide receiver by a long margin and is one of the greatest football players ever. So, Skip, Skip Bayless, you do understand we doing you a solid today. Yes. Because we swore we on We won't do this again. We swore on secrecy. We're going to give you one time. At that Ray Nitschke luncheon. 
And Deacon Jones, he was alive at the time when I went in in 2011, and you say, you, you're Sharp. not doing me a solid. Uh, you, you're trying to divulge Hall of Fame secrets to make your case against me. No, like no. I can't debate We're just that. Trying to, no, but I can. No, it, it's like if somebody was a member of Augusta National, yep. they'd have to tell you things you don't know, things oh. they discuss. So okay. these are the things that the 305 people, there's only 178 of us alive. Yep. When we get together, we're letting you in on it. And okay. this is a one, right. one shot. You're going to get one shot okay. at this. Forgive me. I'm not convinced or impressed with what you're telling me. But go ahead. This is fairly easy for me. It's Jerry Rice, and it's not. It's Jerry Rice by, I'm talking about the difference maybe between Australia and maybe the moon. The moon. That's how far mm -hmm. the distance is between Jerry mm -hmm. Rice and everybody else. Skip, the guy has 14 1,000-yard seasons. The next closest is Randy Moss mm -hmm. with 10. 12, he caught... 1,200 yards receiving at age 40. He's been a Super Bowl MVP. He's been Offensive Player of the Year. If you name us most catches in NFL history, Jerry Wright. Most mm -hmm. receiving yards in NFL history, Jerry Wright. Right. Most receiving touchdowns, Jr. Mm -hmm. Most total touchdowns. Skip, it's not even close. It's not even close. He, he, he is the gold standard. And I know, Mike, look, we love Michael. I love Michael. Is that who he's going to say? Because I was just leaving the floor open because he had 24 hours to think about it. Mm -hmm. Why even think about that? You, you're not talking about Michael Jordan. You're talking about Michael Irvin. Thank you very much. You know what? I'm going to let you go ahead and make your case, and then I'm, I'm going to let Chris rebut you, and then I'm going to come back and rebut you, and then we're going to be mm. done with this conversation. Mm. Obviously, I'm not in the Hall of Fame. All I have done in my career is cover the National Football League since 1975 right here in L.A. with the Rams. I was seven. And I did cover Michael Irvin's Dallas Cowboys, and I know Jerry Rice very well, and I like him very much. So this is not personal at all, because I know Michael, and I know Jerry, and I like both of them. This is business. Michael Irvin is the greatest receiver ever. He's also the most underappreciated receiver ever. I believe the runaway train for Jerry Rice omits the fact that he played in, as I told you earlier in the show, the most dynamic, creative, inventive offense that ever hit the National Football League. It's called the West Coast offense, and he benefited from being thrown passes by Joe Montana and Steve Young, both of whom are in the Hall of Fame. Am I right? Correct. Those are the only two offensive players in the Hall of Fame for those great teams besides Bill Walsh. Bill mm -hmm. Walsh and the two quarterbacks and Jerry Rice, mm -hmm. those are the only ones in the Hall. Charles Haley. Well, he's on defense, okay. and he played oh, with oh, a bunch of I different teams. Talking about on but it's team. not okay, like right. they were the okay, Pittsburgh right. Steelers and they had eight guys on their offensive defensive unit. Michael Irvin was stuck in an offense that was run-based from the start and an offense that had a very simplistic approach to throwing the football with, with very uncreative routes without much variation or no check-with-me's or gimmicks. They basically ran the most basic route tree you could ever run. He's going to run the slant. He's going to run the post. He's going to run the outcut. He's going to run the fly pattern. It's just basically that's what they did. And they dared you to beat them. And Michael Irvin always made the play in the game. So given that, let's go back to stats now. Let's really boil it down to what was really happening here. Yeah. Michael Irvin, per catch in regular seasons, averaged 15.9 yards per catch. Mm -hmm. Jerry Rice, 14.8. Oh, that's interesting. Jerry Rice played 20 years. Okay. Michael played okay. 11. All right. 20 12, years. 12. So, 12. 20, 20 so, years. Mm -hmm. Let's look at postseason games. Michael averaged 15.1 a catch. Jerry, 14.9. How many again, touchdowns did they have? Okay, but, but oh, it again, don't that, that okay, don't matter. It's not well, a you said football stat. team. Let's you go said. to playoff games, yards per game. Mm -hmm. 82.2 for Michael, only 77.4 for Jerry Rice. So somehow, with the chances he was getting to catch the football, he was cashing in big time in both regular season and mm -hmm. postseason. Let's talk about speed, just before to get that out on the table, because I know you've made comments. Michael wasn't the fastest guy. He did run 4-5 before his combine, which is just sort of average wide receiver speed. Michael's the same speed mm -hmm. as me. Okay. Both of them. Right. Slow. Okay. And Jerry <laughs> Rice, Jerry Rice, before his Combine ran yeah. four seven five. Yeah, but there's a thing called game speed. Okay, all right. right. Okay. There's a thing called game speed, and Jerry. And was I would a say lot that faster. also for Michael Irvin, game speed. No, now, Michael was the same speed. Yes. No, he wasn't the same speed. Okay. All hey, right. let's get down to who is the greatest cornerback ever, and it's not even. This is from Australia to the moon. Mm -hmm. It was Dion Sanders. 
Deion Sanders, I've known over the years, many years, has always told me his toughest cover by far was one Michael Irvin. A lot of sources told me, because I was very close to the 49ers during those years, that that year that Dion was a 49er, he used to shame Jerry Rice in practice because practice after practice, he shut him down and locked him up and left Jerry pouting and throwing fits on the sideline. He couldn't get open against Deion Sanders. What was the single greatest one-on-one matchup I ever witnessed in a football game? It was the 1995 season NFC Championship game at Candlestick Park. God bless Candlestick. It's no longer with us, but it was a great place to watch football. And it, it was, was wet and play, muddy. Man. I know. It was, it was a tough day to play that day. <laughs> and thanks to an early Troy Aikman pick six, the Cowboys fell behind in that game 21 to nothing mid-first quarter. And here it came. They had no choice. They couldn't run the football. Emmett had a pulled hamstring, shouldn't have even tried to play in that game. And here came Michael Irvin against Deion Sanders one-on-one. It's the one game I said I would have paid big money to have a front-row seat for that game because we got greatness against greatness. And Michael caught 12 balls for 192 yards and two touchdowns and came back to 38 to 28 and had the ball, and there was a deep throw to Michael Irvin, who had a step on Deion Sanders again, and Deion had to reach and armbar him, and it was a blatant, obvious pass interference that went uncalled. Mm -hmm. Barry Switzer, who was that coach that year, first year, Mm -hmm. ran onto the field like a madman and got a 15-yard penalty that pushed them back out of even field goal range. So not only did they not get the pass interference, they went minus 15, and it cost them the football game and a Super Bowl that they easily would have won over the San Diego Chargers that Steve Young did win, and that should have been four for four Super Bowls for Michael Irvin. So three Super Bowls for Jerry, three for Michael Irvin. That should have been four. Now let's get down to an intangible here. The single greatest wide receiver leader in the history of this league is Michael Irvin. I realize he had issue upon issue off the field. I know him all too well. So how can you be the greatest leader ever if you have all those issues? He was the driving force of the football team. When it was time to practice and time to play, the leader of the team was this man. When it was time to make the speech that galvanized the team that was a dynasty, it came from Michael Irvin. When as a guy so Michael covered... Was a, so Michael was a better talker than Jerry. Jerry is a silent assassin. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Rice, Rice was a follower and not a leader. If you ask anybody who was on his team, I talked to lots of them, he was a follower and not a leader. And what's wrong with that? Okay, Nothing's wrong with that. I'm I mean, just we saying... Criticize all the diva okay. receiver, so now we got a receiver who's okay. the greatest one ever, and he's a follower. Okay, that's but, a good, that's a quality right? too. But I'm, I'm giving points to Michael Irvin because he led a dynasty of a football team. Not only that, but if you look back at the Hurricanes, he was the leader of those teams too. But we're talking about the NFL. Okay. We we're are. Okay, about the I'll, I'll give you that. But this man. Trust me, the one they all wanted in their foxhole when they went to Washington, they went to New York, and they went to Philadelphia in December, they wanted Michael Irvin. He was going to make the catch on the third down to win the game. And I, I've made this case. This isn't a new thing for me. I made it while they were playing. <laughs> Michael made Troy more than Troy made Michael. Because, Stop. hey, security blanket, can, just can, look can, to 88. Can, just throw it out can, there can, for 88. Can, 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 88's going to catch Can I it. ask you something? Michael and I are the same age. Mm-hmm. We were first team All Americans mm-hmm. in high school, yep. 1984. Mm-hmm. USA Today, first team All Americans, mm-hmm. all right? We played three years in college. I left college early. Michael and I were first team All Americans. Mm-hmm. Michael and myself and Tim Brown, we all. I came into the league one year earlier than Michael. Mm-hmm. You tell me, Jerry was already in the league. From 1988, when Michael came into the mm-hmm. league, 12 years later when he retired, you tell me one year. Forget about a career because that ain't no argument. Mm-hmm. You tell me one year he was better than Jerry Rice. What, 1991? That was, that was his best year. I mean, he had 148 targets. One year, maybe. He okay. might have. Are you just doing numbers? Just stats? One well, guy played in the West Coast offense, the other guy played with Emmett Smith. Well, both of them. You, so, so now. I and mean, it's not a fair fight. Skip. Okay, he's a product. Jerry Skip. Rice is somewhat a product Skip. of the Montana okay, Walsh offense. Um, let's do this. Okay. Let's send Michael Irvin to Minnesota, and let's see if he can make eight Pro Bowls with six different quarterbacks. Because it's, it's so depressing to play with Troy freaking Aikman. Oh, my goodness. Like, oh, I got to play with I got to play with Emmitt Smith. Oh, my goodness. What kind of argument is that? You think Michael could have duplicated uh, that in Minnesota? 
Now, and, that's, and this is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, if you put me on the Cowboys in 1988, I guarantee you we win at least three Super Bowls. At least three Super Bowls. Because I don't his, know. Because his productivity. I don't know. Tell me one year he was better. Tell me. He made all pro one year out of 12 years. He made all pro where the writer said he is one of two of the best receivers one mm -hmm. time. Well, I'm glad CC <laughs> took it there. And I know I'm going to get a call, and he's going to say, I told you not to bring my name into this. Uh-oh. More secrets. Sterling Sharp. Mm. They came in the same year. They were six picks apart. Mm -hmm. My brother retired. His last year was mm -hmm. 1994. 94 catches over 1,100 yards, 18 touchdowns. He played seven years. Uh, Michael Irvin played 12. They have the exact number of touchdowns. How many touchdowns they got? 65. Now, I would like to think. I, I don't know touchdowns? if it's true or not, but I would like to think. That Michael scored double-digit touchdowns one time. I would like Three to times he scored seven or eight. To three to four times he scored. In 12 years, he only scored seven or more touchdowns three times. And the first, in the first seven years, my <laughs> brother and Michael came in together. Sterling Sharp has 25 more touchdowns, mm -hmm. 1,200 more yards. 180 more catches. And let me tell you something. Like, while Michael made uh, uh, All-Pro one time, mm -hmm. my brother was first team All-Pro mm -hmm. three times. Okay. And he had how many rings? He got no rings. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we we can't get over Listen. Because you asked about the greatest Okay, receiver. what if Anthony playing with Anthony Dillwig, Mike mm -hmm. Tomzak, and John so, so McCaffrey? Now, so well, now. Did he play with Brett Favre? He played two years with Brett. Okay. Three years right. with Brett Favre. Three, yeah. He hurt his neck, and Brett won the Super Bowl two years after mm -hmm. he left. Okay. You give me All Troy right. Aikman. I had two years with Warren Moon, and Michael had his greatest year um, in 94 mm -hmm. uh, when um, I think Michael caught 118, 112 passes that year. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I they caught, did throw the ball. Uh, they threw the ball, but he was targeted 91 the most. In 91, he was targeted 148 times. He was second in receptions with 93, and he had 1,500 yards. That year, he might have had a better year than Jerry Rice. Right. But besides that, all the other years, no, hey, he didn't. All I know is I covered these teams over these four yeah, years. Yeah, but you should have been covering player, some of the other teams. Okay, I watched all the other teams, and player after player told me the driving force of those championship teams was number 88. The leader of the teams was number 88. The playmaker, which is his nickname on those teams, was number 88. The big playmaker when the money was on the line in the big playoff okay, game. Okay, so where does moment. Jerry Rice rank? Let's, let's, why don't you give us your list? Because Jerry, Jerry got three times the touchdowns. Three, three times. How many? Three times the touchdown. Well, I, I'll give you number two on my list, but Michael Irvin is number one on my list. How many touchdowns Michael got? And you know what? I'll, I'll even have? tell you it's 65. close. He got it's, it's not from Australia to the moon, but Michael Irvin's a little better than Jerry Rice. I'll at take what? It. I'll okay. At everything. But, but what's the rest at of the everything. list? Not run after the catch. His hands aren't better than Jerry. Yeah. Why, why would Dion say His release is off the line of scrimmage. How about toughest cover from Dion? Because the, the reason why, because it's strength. Mm -hmm. Michael is too physical for Dion. Dion likes to play... He mirrors you. He felt he, he's now a guys, dancing now, now, guys who he can be physical with, he will mm -hmm. attack them at the line. But the other guys, he likes to mirror them. So guys like myself and like Michael, they aren't the best matchup for mm -hmm. Dion. But Jerry Rice is not a good matchup for no one. Okay, but he was not a good matchup for Dion in practice because he couldn't beat Dion. <laughs> Trust me on We're that. We're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> yep. I think we'll be getting calls from CC. Sterling and from Michael. And from Hall of Famers. Look here, look here. I, 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 this is it. I don't even like to break my brother's that? name yeah. up. Man, but, but you did. But, but I put his, his seven years career with J Michael, Jerry, with anybody that right. played the game. All right. You've Aww. got both secrets. You're both on Hall of Fame probation. <laughs> exactly. Mm. No mercy. This is the Skip and Shannon Undisputed Podcast, where we're delivering you an unscripted, unfiltered, undisputed version of the biggest topics of the day show. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, like us on Facebook at Undisputed on FS1, follow on Twitter at Undisputed, and catch us at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 Pacific, Monday through Friday on FS1. You can find us on Channel 219 on DirecTV, 150 on DISH. What a fun show we had today. We have to leave all the debates there for now. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm your host, Joy Taylor. As mentioned before, we are live from Houston all next week to get you guys ready for the Super Bowl. We have a great lineup of guests, including Gronk, Eli Manning, Drew Brees, and many more. It's going to be a blast. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you Monday live from H-Town. Facts, sports, one of one.